I am because I don't want to take up any more of Angud's uh, time because we appreciate that he's here. Uh, we were able to get a screen up and going. I do still have a lot of people that I'm trying to admit, so I'll be doing a lot of behind the scenes multitasking. So hope I do a good job for everybody. And I want to make a quick introduction, although I don't feel that he needs an introduction. Um, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. Uh, we have Angud Singh. I actually met him years ago. I'm quite sure he doesn't even remember, but he knows that I've been a pest throughout the many, many years. Uh, without him, I would not have even became PIX40 certified, so thank you. <laughs> and then also, I wanted to point out one thing that just really, really impressed me was that throughout our conversations back and forth, preparing for today's presentation, he really tried to reach out to some of his coworkers and have someone uh, co-present with him because he he's uh, appreciative to the female uh, co-team that he works with and so uh, he tried really hard and apparently we are in popular demand and he could not connect with any of them to be available today so hopefully moving forward we will be able to have that that would be an awesome opportunity but uh, I just want to thank you and we've got your screen up go ahead and take it over. I'm good. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stacey. Can you guys hear me? Everybody can hear me all right? It's quiet. Awesome. It's quiet. Do it's you want me to, I can, I can project or I can put headphones on. You what can would you prefer? project is fine. Projecting works mm -hmm. a little increase. All righty. Well, just let me know. I'm more than happy to put headphones on. I sit at this desk all day, so I'm pretty <laughs> used to doing the webinars. I think uh, I do see quite a few familiar faces and a lot of new faces. So it's always good to chat with new people. I think that's more important than, well, it's as important as, you know, catching up with uh, old friends. Uh, Adrian, really nice to see you there with your AUVSI Lone Star banner in the background. And yeah, absolutely. Just like Daisy said, I tried to get one of my female colleagues to do this talk instead of me, purely because I do pretty much all of the PIX40 client facing talks. Uh, Com UAV, DJI Airworks, um, AVSI, Lone Star, um, pretty much any talk or webinar that PIX40 does, usually I do it. But I think that a lot of times we have, so at PIX40, I've had two female managers in the past. Um, and then right now, the head of our geospatial team is, so the, head, the person that's the product manager for all Mapper and basically the core of our business, um, the head of our marketing, the head of our training department, the head of finance, um, the head of our capture team. Yeah, most of our managers are women, actually. So we, so they made sure that I said that first before I did this talk. They wanted me to, you know, put that out there. And yet I couldn't get anyone to do this talk instead of me. So that's okay because in the future we'll make that happen. So anyway, I do have uh, some cool stuff for you today. I don't remember what my title for the talk was exactly. I bet I could pull it up somewhere. But um, I did want to focus essentially on kind of one of the main things that drones do really well, which is lower the barrier to entry for research. So I think if we put it in a global perspective, right, drones are a very interdisciplinary tool that allows us to practice a lot of different disciplines of science. But really, we're taking what used to be this very macro level analytics perspective and bring it to the micro. And what that means is when we look at science like GIS or remote sensing, we're looking at satellite imagery that has these big pixels, you know, you, uh, set Landsat imagery, so the free satellite imagery that you can go get off the internet from the USGS. It has a resolution of 30 meters, which means that every pixel in that image represents 30 meters by 30 meters which doesn't really allow you to learn a lot about things up close and personal or at a very low level, which I think is incredibly important for us to learn about the world that surrounds us to a higher degree, right? If you want to really learn about everything, yes, you have the micro and the macro, you have to be able to have both. And with a tool like the drone, where we've been able to move the sciences of GIS and remote sensing and these geospatial sciences 
into the micro level. And we've really lowered the barrier to entry for research. Now students and professors and, and just you know, folks that don't have the money and the resources to buy expensive satellite imagery are able to utilize drones and the nice cameras we have on them to do type of the type of research that 10, 15 years ago would have taken $100,000. Today, you can do some of this research for under five grand. And I think that's tremendously important in software companies like Pix4D, where I work, um, have really been on the forefront of enabling this change. So I think, you know, right after school, I moved to San Francisco to work for Pix4D. And we had this idea where, you know, all the tech bros, they talk about how their technology is disrupted and they're, they're working for companies that are changing the world when a lot of them really aren't. They're just making rich people richer. At least that's my personal opinion. And at least here at Pix4D, I'm proud where we actually have technology that's making the world better. And we actually work with folks in a way that makes their life safer. I mean, we, we transition and, and do a lot of work with blue collar industries like oil, gas and mining and land surveying. And here by using a drone, you're increasing the speed, you're decreasing the amount of time they have to be in the field, which reduces you know, physical injuries, it makes things safer, and it gives greater transparency because you have these amazing tools that are collecting all this data. So I'm gonna go through like four corporate slides about what Pix4D as a company is, if you haven't heard of Pix4D before, um, as well as just a refresher to really get at what we're doing. And then I'm gonna go through a couple interesting use cases that I find fascinating when it comes to how are we actually learning about the world around us in better ways. So Pix4D is a photogrammetry company. The word, the, like Pix4D as a name literally means pictures in four dimension. So from the remote sensing angle, you can get super technical and you can say, hey, it's an increase of spectral, spatial, temporal, and uh, one more resolution, which are basically fancy ways of saying you can get way more data, way faster, and way more accurate than you could before. But also, Pix4D from the actual core pixel perspective is you get an X, you get a Y, and a Z, which are obviously the, the three-dimensional locations of where some place exists in the world. But what's really important is the time, the fourth dimension, where it's not just about getting data one time. It's about getting data when you want it and when you need it. So that's your temporal resolution where you can go out there with a drone, fly it over an area and create this super high resolution 3D model or map. And you can do it when you need to do it, which means that you can really understand how the land around us is changing over time. And I think that's tremendously important because before when we're using uh, satellite imagery coming from you know, up in space, if there's a cloud in the way, well, can't learn anything there because there's a cloud in the way, well here, we have a drone that allows you to capture data when you need it. And I think that's tremendously important. So really, Pix4D is a photogrammetry company. Photogrammetry is this big, complicated word that literally means to measure from photographs. And I think that that's the one key thing you should take out of this today is that if you want to make an accurate measurement about anything, an accurate measurement only comes when you apply photogrammetry algorithms to photographs. Otherwise, you can't really, you cannot take a normal photograph and create an accurate measurement or measure something from it. For example, if you're standing at a beautiful landscape and you got your family in the foreground and then there's this mountain range in the background, I, you can't tell how far away you are from the mountain range, but if you applied photogrammetry to those images, you could. And so that, like, why? Because there's perspective in that photograph. Just like our human eyes, we have perspective. We have two eyes that you have like two rays of light that actually they come into your eyes from whatever you're looking at. And then your brain triangulates what you're looking at and you can tell how far away it is, right? Like if I cover one of my eyes and I look at something, I can't tell exactly how far away it is. If I cover one eye and try to walk around, I'm probably gonna trip on something. Whereas if I have both my eyes, I'm pretty good at my depth perception and I know where stuff is. Cameras work exactly the same way. If you have one camera, there's perspective in that photograph and you're not necessarily able to understand exactly how far away something is. But if you take a bunch of photographs and then put it through software like Pix4D, well, you can figure out exactly where everything lies as it would in the real world with that accurate measurement. And that's the core reason that we have companies like Pix4D. That's the core reason 
that you have to buy software like Fix40 if you want to know exactly how much you know stuff is in a pile or exact measurement from you know one end of a bridge to the other end of the bridge or how tall a cell phone tower is, et cetera. Um, so it really comes down to taking photos, applying algorithms so you can measure from them. So here, this is really what we do. You take a bunch of photos from the different angles and then it creates this super accurate 3D model of what that looks like. So this is an example of you know, a junkyard and we do a lot of business in the collision reconstruction space, which is the science of investigating car accidents. So we work with a lot of police departments specifically on collision reconstruction. Um, and essentially that means there's a car accident and traditionally for a car accident, you have guys that go out there and they'll take total stations or laser scanners, which are very expensive equipment to take, make 3d models, these laser scanners, you put them in one place and it, it scans the whole area. Then you move it to another location and it scans the whole area. Sometimes it can close the road down for two to three hours while they're getting an exact 3D model of where everything lies so they can measure out the skid marks and the gouge marks and the pavement so they can figure out exactly who may be at fault in that accident. This is a legitimate science that is actually practiced in pretty much all 50 states. And usually collision reconstructionists are some of the more like very intelligent police officers that I've had the opportunity of running into in my life. So I actually very much like working with collision reconstructionists. Um, well, now the problem is that if the roads close for two to three hours, all of us as civilians, we have to sit there and wait and do nothing. And that sucks because you're idling, you know, maybe if there's an ambulance, it can't go where it needs to go. So I personally really do care about this application because one, I'm impatient. And two, I really believe that roadways are the best way to get the economy moving and you got to have stuff going around. I used to work on an ambulance. If the roads close, that sucks for my patient in the back. So let's get these guys on forward thinking technology so that they're not using something that's closing the road for three to four hours so that they're actually, you know, doing, doing a job in a more effective manner. So you get them a drone and you fly it around the collision scene and maybe in 15 to 20 minutes, they've gone ahead and collected all this imagery. Now we can leave, clean up the scene, open up the road and you get a highly accurate 3D model that you can utilize to then investigate that scene. I think that's one application of where Pix40 has been very powerful. Um, so about Pix40 as a company, right? I, I told you I had to do some corporate slides. So Pix40 as a company, well, actually, this is cool. It's not that corporate. So I think it's cool because it's an organically funded company. What that means is we're not like, you know, going to some rich hedge fund manager and saying, hey, give me $5 million so I can build this company because I have an idea, which is really cool. Sometimes I wish we did that. But our CEO is a little bit more practical. So he doesn't do that. Instead, he makes us work really hard and sell software that people actually use and all that money goes into building up the company. So now that's, you know, I'm a sales guy. I have to sell stuff. And if you don't buy it, then, you know, we don't exist. So, and that's really cool because it's completely organically funded, which means that we've grown to seven offices all across the world, some 200 plus global, you know, employees purely based on people actually using this stuff. And this is going to be our 10th year anniversary. Um, and I think Pix40 has been a very much a pillar of the drone industry because, like I said, the whole thing about drones is there are these awesome flying cameras that allow us to collect data and learn about things around us. Um, and this is probably, this is one of the coolest things. It's an organically funded company. People actually like the software. It really works. This is kind of how I got into it. I used the software in my academic work. Uh, and then I came and joined Pix40. So we have, um, so actually, the rest of world, which is uh, Europe and Asia, that's our biggest market. Uh, and then the United States, you know, the great United States is the second largest market in the whole world. And then Japan is our third largest independent market. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of application. We built an office in Tokyo. Um, and then our headquarters are in Lausanne, Switzerland. So Pix40 is a Swiss company. Um, we say that it's a Swiss company, but we're an incredibly international company. The people that work in Switzerland come from all over, uh, all over the world. You know, I don't know if we actually have a lot of Swiss people. We do, but we have like a lot of Americans. We have a lot of, we have some Canadians. We have a lot of uh, folks from Greece. We have Indians. We have folks from China. We have a couple of guys from Japan. From all over the world, we really do have a very international population that works at Pix40. So it's very cool. Um, we have a ton of products. It all started with one though. It all started with Pix40 Mapper, which when most people think about Pix40, they think Pix40 Mapper, 
that's our flagship solution. I'm seeing some nodded, nodding heads on the screens. You know, I think some of you probably already own this software, have used it before. And that's what, when, you know, when Daisy says she's PIX40 certified, she means she's taking our exam to work with PIX40 Mapper. And then we have PIX40 Capture, which is this free app to fly the drone. You don't have to use it. You can use any app on the market. There's definitely apps out there that are way better than using PIX40 Capture, but ours is free and it's super, super simple. And then we have all these other problems. And the reason that the company grows like this is as the drone industry grows, we realize that there's some folks out there that only have applications in a certain regard, right? They only want to do certain stuff. And then they want to do that stuff faster and more efficient than anything else. So we build other softwares that take the core algorithms from PIX40 Mapper, but make them specific to specific applications. So PIX40 Mapper is like the Swiss Army knife. But if you're working in a kitchen all day, you want a chef's knife, you don't want a Swiss Army knife. So you get that and you get that new tool and it, it really some of this stuff, but I'll go more on applications. Uh, and then at the end, we'll do some questions. But um, the workflow is almost the same for every product that we have. You go out there, you fly a drone or you take a camera, you take a bunch of photos, you put it in the software, it makes a 3D model. You can do that on the cloud, you can do that on the desktop, it's really up to you and what fits into your own workflows. Um, and so now let's talk about the today, the forward thinking of the research, where we want to go. Because I think this is really important. You know, we've gotten to a point where the drone industry as a whole is, it's very much recognized now, you know. Uh, I think a good way to say that is, I know that, you know, due to COVID, we don't have in-person events, which is a good thing. Um, but if we did have in-person events, I think we would notice that there's more suits at our conferences, right? When we started going to drone conferences five, six, seven years ago, you know, people were in shorts and t-shirts and, you know, you know, it was more casual and drones were cool. And we've seen it become more corporate because there's a lot of application as the use cases have gotten more solidified as it's been demonstrated that drones are these amazing tools that really are disruptive and are going to take over and, and you know, be utilized in, in a multitude of different industries we start to see that there's more suits at the conferences because there's these consulting agencies that are coming in, you know, Deloitte and KPMG and, and Accenture now have proper uh, drone programs or consulting arms that spe are specific to this. Um, insurance companies are starting to sell corporate insurance for drones. And that was based on the fact that drones were faster, they were cheaper, they were safer, right? It does increase safety. If you have a guy that, you know, 30% of all cell phone tower inspections are done purely to see if there's a bird's nest at the top. And if it's an endangered bird's nest, well, you can't move it, so you gotta build a new tower. But that requires somebody climbing up the scaffold. Or if it's calculating the volume for a giant stockpile of aggregate, whether that be at your state DOT or at a mining company, well, they have to take a GPS unit and they have to climb over this entire pile of stuff that could be loose, and there's a potential for industry if you're carrying a GPS, heavy GPS unit and walking over an unstable pile. So in that situation, now if you fly a drone over this pile, it's a lot safer. You're not gonna twist your ankle. Um, there's another application in, in, the, in the wildfire space where they do what's called controlled burns, where they go in, which is very good. I mean, look, the whole West Coast is burning right now, so this is a hot topic. Well, proper land management practices are that you should remove dead vegetation so that we don't have wildfires that you know explode like this. Of course, global warming is adding to it, et cetera. But in that practice of, of, of you know, controlled burns, the fire departments typically will take a section where there's a lot of dead vegetation, usually close to you know, humans and close to neighborhoods, and they'll, they'll burn it to remove the dead vegetation, replenish the soil, allow more you know, live plants to grow. In that process, typically the media, as well as their command staff, wants to know how many acres did you burn? Hopefully you didn't make a mistake and burn something you shouldn't have. And so what they do is they get on their little ATV or they take their GPS locator in their hand and they physically walk the entirety of the perimeter of that area that burned. But sometimes that can take hours. And sometimes you're walking on, you know, rural land where it doesn't have an actual trail. It's not like a nice smooth hiking trail, right? There's a potential for injury. Yes, it's very low, but I mean, there is a potential to twist your ankle. And also it can take a couple hours. Now, if you can fly a drone over the whole thing and you can create a map and get the exact answer of exactly how much area was burned, I think that's a tremendous, you know, movement forward in terms of
progression of safety and innovation, et cetera. So really, drones are rapidly changing infield operations for a multitude of industries. We know that. We know they're faster. We know they're cheaper. We know they're safer. Today, the focus has to be on easier. Sometimes when you adopt new technology, you know, there's a, there's a, a curve of productivity where they say that when you want to increase your productivity, you have to invest in new workflows or you have to invest in new technology. And so your productivity actually decreases a little bit in the beginning, right? You have to learn how to fly the drone. You have to learn how to use the software. You have to spend money to get trained and use all this stuff. So in the beginning, your productivity will actually decrease a little bit. Today, we want to get away from that decrease in productivity where we're no longer just encapsulated with how cool these things are, but really now focus on are we making people's lives actually easier? And almost even more important than that, is the data actionable? Which means that it's not just a fancy 3D model that you show off and everyone goes ooh and ah, but does that 3D model extract real information for you so that you can answer questions that as an industry you want to answer? Um, and that's the real focus now, is easier and actionable. And so now we'll go into some of, what are these research topics? What are folks actually out there doing that enable that progressive change away from, hey, drones are awesome and cool, now to drones are the obvious thing to do. So I think the first thing internally at PIX40, let's talk about internal PIX40 research. We built this office in Madrid, Spain, um, about two, three years ago. Uh, we hired a bunch of really, really awesome data scientists, machine learning engineers um, to focus purely on the telecom industry, right? I think for years within the drone space, we've said, yeah, you can fly cell phone towers. You can take pictures of the top. You can make a 3D model of it. But the reality was four years ago, we were kind of talking like, hey, this is possible, but it wasn't that awesome. It wasn't actually that good. And so what we did is we built this, PIX40 built this office in Madrid, Spain, to purely focus on cell phone towers. So photogrammetry is really good at mapping land, map, you know, but it's not that awesome at mapping stuff like cell phone towers or lattice structure bridges, things that are tall and skinny and they have a lot of parts and they have what we call multiple fields of view where you look at one side of the tower and then you also got a top an area behind it and then you have some pieces of metal going from one end to the other connecting it. Well, there's a lot of stuff. It's a complicated geometry. And so when you have a situation like this, where you have to map, map model something, 3D model something that's like fascinating and interesting like this, well, it's kind of hard. So we built this office in Madrid, Spain to work on machine learning algorithms. Basically, right, like AI, we used to call it AI, now in the tech space, we prefer to use the word machine learning because I think AI is a little scary. And the reality is that my hope is that machines never make content, like actual conscious decisions like that. You know, we've seen enough scary movies, but machine learning should absolutely be able to take basic problems that we have and make them a lot easier to solve. So you take a drone, you fly it around this cell phone tower, you make this 3D model. Well, what do people actually want to know? They want to, the owner of that asset, the owner of that 3D model, they want to know how many panel antennas are on it. They want to know, does that antenna have any rust? They want to know who owns the antenna that's on my asset or on my you know, tower, right? It's like the cell phone companies, you know, like AT&T and, and Verizon and, and Sprint, T-Mobile, et cetera. They rent space from asset owners. So the guys that actually own the tower, companies like Crown Castle and American Tower, and then they rent, it's literally like their tenants, their panel, their antennas is a tenant on this guy's tower. So now you have, the, you know, the, the, the tenant saying, hey, who else lives on my tower? Like, who are my neighbors? Who are my competitors? So they got to have these 3D models that show them what they are, and they can figure out who else is on that antenna tower, see their competition. But also, you have the actual asset owner that wants to know exactly what's on his tower or her tower and where that exists in the real world. The problem is these guys don't own like 20 towers. They own like 100,000 towers, 200,000 towers. They're everywhere, right? We see them all the time. Some of them are pretty ugly. Some of them are hidden and look like trees. So they got to know where everything is all around the world. And so if they can send somebody out there in the field with a drone and that makes a very accurate 3D model, and then they can go onto a web-based portal, onto a cloud, and 
they can log in and they can go on a 2D map and they can click on their thing and say, hey, here's my tower. And then they can look at exactly what it looks like. They can extract information. And then you have machine learning algorithms. So the computer algorithm actually tells you what's the angle of the tower, what's the dimension of the panel, uh, what's the angle of the panel, um, what, is, uh, what, what exactly do the cables look like? And so then they can go in and they can say, hey, this cable has some rust or this rigging looks loose or this shouldn't look like this. Then they can communicate to other people about it on a high level through the internet without actually having to be, make phone calls to send text messages or to be on the ground and climbing that tower with you know, harnesses and cables on. Um, so internally, this is one of the biggest projects that we're working on and we released a product called Pix40 Inspect uh, earlier this summer um, that literally does exactly that, exactly what I just said. It makes the 3D model of this cell phone tower, except it actually makes it really accurate and look good. And these are screenshots. That, so what you're looking at on the screen here, these are screenshots of the 3D models coming out of it. And you see that, that green bounding box on one of the panel antennas? That's the machine learning algorithm going in and saying, hey, this is an antenna. This is the panel antenna. I recognize it. I've counted it. And then you can put notes and say who owns it and what frequencies is it transmitting, et cetera. Um, and that's the internal research that Pix40 has been very interested in recently, is how do we actually take the algorithms that were developed five or six years ago that take you know, a, 2D, uh, a 2D image and make a 3D model out of it, which is magic to begin with, and then now add to that and be able to extract answers. So I think that's really fascinating. Um, before I go on, because I've been talking for like a while now, is there any questions? We should have, you know, anything at all? No questions? All right, we'll ask them Wait later. a second, Desi has questions. This is okay. specific, this one right here that you have shown us, this program is specific for cell tower. Is yep. it? Cell towers, grain silos, okay. lattice structure bridges, anything that's tall and skinny. Tall and skinny. All yep. right, I like it, thank you. And so now I wanna talk about like kind of some of the other, you know, folks out there that are doing real cool research and potential speakers that could come up and people that are using PIX40 in the field. And so Dr. Margaret Kalaska at McGill University, she was my professor. So she's the one that got me into drones and got me into PIX40 um, and into this whole world. And I think she's definitely one of the top remote sensing professors uh, in the world at McGill University in Montreal in Canada. Um, and she does some incredibly amazing work. She was invited to speak at DJI Airworks two years ago because some of the research that she's coming out with is just mind blowing what they're able to do. I mean, what we're talking about today, like making 3D models of stuff that look really good. I think she was doing that five, six years ago by adding her own algorithms and cleaning stuff up and extracting information from it. And so one really cool way that, you know, I think her research really started up is she did this project um, in, in Brazil uh, called the Fish and Forest Project. So this is a project I worked on when I was in school, in university. And, uh, and, and help them with. And what it's about is there was this, you know, this big energy company that wanted to open up this giant dam. There was a gigantic dam on this river in Brazil and they had obviously engineers paid by the, you know, energy company come in and do an assessment of when we open the dam up so that we, you know, hydroelectric dam so we can produce more energy, how, how is it gonna affect the villages and the people and the fish and the forests below that dam. Well, they made an assessment that it was going to flood X amount of acres and kill X amount of species and, you know, displace X amount of people. And clearly they were wrong because they were the engineers paid by the company that was going to do this. So there was independent academics that went in from McGill University and some other universities. And this was very early on, you know, 2014, 2015, when drones and software like this were just on the forefront of research. And they flew drones over these really beautiful tidal pools and um, where literally you would have this river that's very rocky and you would have a small pool of water in the middle of that river and you would have a species of fish, that's the word for a species of something that exists only in one place is endemic. So you would have an endemic fish, fish species that literally existed in that one pool in the middle of this river. 
and it would not exist anywhere else in the world. And then you would have another pool where you would have one species of fish that existed in that one location, and not anywhere in the world. And so they went in and they flew drones and processed all this data and they did the calculations that if you open up the dam and X amount of water is now released that wasn't there before, it would flood so much, you know, it would increase the water level by, you know, this amount. Or if you released it to the way that they really wanted to, it would release the water by this amount and it would kill this many species and it would, you know, flood this many acres and displace this many, you know, uh, native population from the location, et cetera. And they really proved that it was going to be pretty bad for everybody. You know, that I think that the cost of the, the dam being opened up for the hydroelectric energy was actually outweighed by the loss of endemic species and, and by folks being displaced. And I think this is one of the first really big projects that highlighted how awesome drones were. Because if, if any of you don't know, there's a, there's a data product called the digital surface model. It's literally a map where every pixel tells you the elevation at that location so it's an elevation map right it just tells you what's higher what's lower etc but if you can make it of rivers and stuff like this it's not just saying you know it's not just showing you the hillside right it's showing you exactly every rock on that hillside when you fly a drone and use a software like pix4d we can give you a surface model where you can tell the difference in one centimeter of elevation drop i mean that's pretty impressive in how high resolution these data products are so when you make these, these models like this, now you have micro level insights and you can really tell how much of that area is going to be flooded, what the true impact is and run a multitude of different models to understand what's gonna happen in this situation. And I think that this project for me was really what got me into drones and got me where I am today. Uh, and it was thanks to Dr. Margaret Clasco, who's certainly one of the best remote sensing professors in the world. I mean, her publications are amazing. So, so that's, I think, I wanted to share that story of how drones really helped in that one particular application. Um, so now we have University of Vermont. The University of Vermont is one of the, probably the forefront for drone research. There's a professor, his name's Jarlath Dunn O'Neill. He's presented in front of the Senate a couple of times. He was in the army. Now he's a professor at the University of Vermont. And his drone lab uses a lot of the SenseFly EVs so the fixed wing drone units. So in the picture here, you can see it's that little foam plane. It's a very expensive foam plane, but it's also one of the best mapping drones in the whole world um, called the SenseFly EV. It's a Swiss company, uh, PIX40. We consider them like our sister company. They're out of the same university in Switzerland. And this, this foam plane has cameras that are specifically designed for drone mapping. My hope is that the fire service really starts to buy a ton of these. I think that we lack, we use too many quadcopters in firefighting in the United States today, we really need to transition folks over to using uh, fixed wing drone units like this. Because if we have, you know, a, a 10, 20, 100 acre wildfire, you know, a 20 minute battery in a Phantom 4 Pro isn't doing much for us. We really got to be getting out there with an hour flight time. And that only comes with, with sense fly drones like this. So what they did was at the University of Vermont, they do really awesome work. They're an FAA Assure zone. So essentially that lab does training on public safety for with drones. Um, and, and Emma used to work in the lab um, and now she's doing her master's at the University of Vermont. But when she was a research assistant working in the lab, they did a really cool project where they went to Joshua Tree National Park um, in Southern California, which is an awesome place. If you've never been there, the trees really do look like they're aliens. I mean, I don't think they're, I can't believe that's on earth. But you go to Joshua Tree National Park and you have these very old mining sites these old, you know, locations, kind of old Western movie like mining sites. Well, sometimes we destroy these mining sites, right? We have to clean them up. Maybe that they, they, they're causing an environmental problem or maybe the land wants to be repurposed. Well, when you destroy something, you lose a bit of history. And I think drones have been really powerful from an application standpoint in archeology span because we make these incredibly beautiful 3D models that are super accurate. And so from an archeological standpoint, we can use drones to fly over locations to now create these 3D models that preserve the structure perfectly. So when they go ahead and they fly these digital, these, these old mining sites, right, in, in, um, in Joshua Tree National Park, and by the way, this isn't just an isolated case here. There, you know, in Turkey, you have a lot of old, old Ottoman Empire uh, sites where, where researchers are going and 
they're taking photos. Uh, oh, there's an awesome video on Pix40's blog going in and doing the interiors of the, um, a Japanese company went and they used really high, like 100 megapixel cameras to go in and do um, a perfect 3D models of the whole, uh, the pyramids of Giza. So if you ever have, if you ever want to dream of like walking through the pyramids of Giza, but you don't actually want to go there, you can just go watch the video on our website now and it will fly you through the entirety of the pyramid of Giza. And so that was a, a 3D model, a perfect 3D model that was made with Pix4D. And so what this does is, is it creates what's called a digital twin. A digital twin is, like it sounds, a digital version of what exists in the real world. And so if we can create digital twins, yes, it has a historical benefit because it enables archaeology professors or even students in the future to then put on VR goggles and envision themselves actually in that location in the real world um, and be able to explore locations and see the way that past civilizations built structures without physically being on that site because now you have a digital twin of it and it increases that accessibility. But I think this line of thinking and where this comes practically in the real world that goes beyond archaeology is now we have a lot of firefighters or soldiers or um, you know even surgeons that they need to train in certain environments so that they can practice and be proficient. Well, if you can make a perfect 3D model of a site, then you can put it in VR and then you can train in that VR environment. And we're starting to see this in fire services across the world where um, there are reality capture companies that are going in and using software like Pix4D to produce these incredibly accurate 3D models, uh, realistic 3D models of what it looks like Put that into a VR environment and then imagine you're training a firefighter uh, to enter a wildfire scene or to enter a, a building or a tunnel structure. Well, now they can wear these, wear these equipment um, and they can have the software that's, you know, technology like this has been produced and then go ahead and actually figure that out. So I think that's really cool and a pretty cool application of how we're pushing the boundary of research with, with 3D modeling and photogrammetry. Um, so Maddie's slides didn't make it onto here. So I'm going to switch and open them up because hers were super cool. And I actually think that you should have Maddie on to talk about what her research is because it's quite impressive. Um, and now we're going to talk about applying machine learning to, sorry, I have so many monitors. When Daisy talks about having actual monitors, I actually have like, I have seven monitors. Um, so I got to find where my folder is. Oh, it's behind the Zoom thing. That's why I can't find it. Okay, so while you're looking, yeah, let's please have her on. <laughs> I'd love to have that connection. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will connect you. This is super cool. Well, I won't steal all her thunder, but I'm going to show you her research because it's pretty cool. Okay, so now you guys can see it. So they went to the, Ar to the Falcon Islands, and they wanted to count all these, these albatross, these birds. So they wanna count the species, right? I actually worked on a project that's very similar to this a couple of years ago, except the, al the algorithm techniques that, that she used here are things that I wish we had five years ago. I was counting turtles off the coast of Indonesia. So, and also uh, one of my best friends, he's doing his PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. This summer they counted oysters on tops of rocks. And why is it important to count them? Well, because then you know how many exist and you know if we're overfishing or underfishing. And that's important, right, for sustainability of, of, these, uh, of these, you know, plants and animals as we move forward. Um, and so here you have this awesome project where I'm going to walk you through it and, and not say it in a very technical way. I'm going to, you know, just explain it nicely. So you got the Falcon Islands are right here. And then... They went in and they basically just flew drones. So this is what one picture looks like, right? That is one of those albatrosses. And these are rocks. So do you want to go and count how many albatrosses are in one photograph? Absolutely not, right? That's a terribly tedious task. And furthermore, it's subject to a tremendous amount of error because the albatross basically looks like the rock next to it which is probably, oh, you know, over a long time now they protect themselves. They look like the environment that they're around. They're kind of camouflaged in there. Well, the great thing is you fly a drone, you get a super high resolution photo of it. 
And now we can apply an algorithm to count how many there actually are. And so that's pretty much exactly what Maddie did and the Duke Marine Laboratory did. So this is a picture. And then these are the albatross, the birds. Ooh, they're pretty cool, I think. And uh, here, I'll just make it full screen. Um, oh, never mind. It won't do that. It went full screen on one of my other monitors. So here you have the albatross. Now you train an algorithm. So you go in and it's machine learning and you give it tons and tons of data. You give it an image and you say, hey, I want you to count how many are correct. And then it counts it. And then you go in as a human and you tell it whether it did the right job or the wrong job. And if it did the wrong job, that's called retraining. So you retrain this algorithm. Right? It's just like a child. Basically, machine learning is just like training a puppy or a child. It does something wrong, and then you tell it it did it wrong, and it does it again. And if it did it right, you give it a treat. And if it did it wrong, then you don't. Right? And so, same thing. It's just like training a puppy. And that's basically what if you tell that to a data scientist, they get mad at me. But that's okay because that's what they're doing. So, here you have this image, and you're training it, and you're basically telling it whether it's right or wrong. And you just have to keep doing it until it comes out correct. And so, they did that. And then they put all their images through Pix4D and they made this super high res 3D model or point cloud that shows exactly of what that site looks like. And then they highlight the areas of where all these birds are with red pixels. And so now the algorithm says, this is how many birds there are. Then it goes in and it superimposes it on top of the image. And now you have a map that shows you exactly where all of the albatross are at a particular time and in a particular space. And if you continue to do this, we can track their migratory patterns to a much higher degree than we previously could. We can figure out their eating habits. We can figure out what, what on a much, much more, you know, with a lower, uh, lower threshold of error, basically like you're more accurate, what's really happening to these species? What are things that are affecting them in negative ways? And what can we do as humans to be good stewards to, to land like this? So this is a super cool way of, of applying research where now, do you see this one? Now we're even counting the little penguins that are next to the albatrosses. So now the blue is the albatross and the red are the penguins. And so you train the different algorithm. You say, okay, learn just how to find the penguins, learn just how to find the albatrosses, combine it all together. And now we can figure out how friendly the penguins and the albatross really are with each other. And so I think that's really cool. And it pushes, pushes the barrier you know, of research further allows us to really learn about stuff in a much more um, kind of intricate, high-end way. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, three or four different folks out there that I think are doing super cool research for good things. You know, sometimes we do research, obviously, as a corporate company for industry because money is very important. But at the same time, I think research like this helps the world become a better place. So uh, that's kind of the end of what I had prepared for you guys. I think we have a couple minutes left. We can absolutely have a have a discussion um, of about pretty much whatever you want to chat about. Um, and I'm here for questions. So thank you very awesome. much. Fantastic presentation. Oh my gosh. And when you did that mining area, that's right up my alley. For anybody who knows me, that's what I do. I love going out and mapping and doing the mining areas. So fantastic. I think we do have some questions from people. Um, we could do a couple of different ways. We could pop it open in the chat. Also, really quick, like I, I did put um, some of your information in in the That's chat, fine. but uh, is it okay if I put your email in Yeah, yeah, throw in it in there. there. Yeah, send me emails. That's what I do all day long, right? Okay. It's another hour of the day. Yeah. It's okay. 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 So uh, if anybody wanted to open up for questions, go ahead, or we can pop them into the chat and kind of review the chat. I'll go ahead and put your information in there. My name is Terry. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So um, basically the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, here in Florida has an RFP out to do almost the exact a similar study to the albatross study that you put on the screen um, and they may be extending the RFP. So my question was if I wanted to use PIX4D for their RFP, do you guys provide personnel to help me assist in writing the RFP since I don't know much about PIX4D 
Um, and also, do you have like scientific research people on staff? So if I forwarded the RFP to you with their requirements, we could both yeah, work together in partnership on that. So we've done similar. I've actually done similar things like that in the past. It's not typically what we do because we just make the software that people use to do all this cool stuff. But uh, yes, I think it's, it's always good because I know kind of this information. I'm more than happy to connect with you and talk about what you want to do and then help put the vocabulary and the vernacular in the correct way so that when you put that out there, people that actually know what they're doing can respond. Um, and if you want to be connected to the Duke Marine Research Laboratory as well, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to collaborate. You know? Okay, I have a second question. My second part question is, um, let's say we, let's hypothetically say we put together the RFP, they give it to us, um, and I take all the images for them, um, and they pay for the software. I'm a little confused, like, once you take the images and you import them into your software and you've already like say the project is paid for do you always have access to the images through like a login and a username like you don't have like 10 years down the road you don't have to pay another subscription to get access to the images like do you understand what i'm saying yep absolutely and so i think it'd be great to connect and i'm more than happy to spend 30 40 minutes on the phone and explain all of this to you so the, what you're asking is essentially that, yes, you should always own your own data. And so even if you process something through PIX40, it exports it as a map or it exports it as a 3D model. And you should save that on your own computers within your own IT network so that you have that at a later date. Um, we don't walk anybody's accounts. You can download full access everything. All that PIX40 is doing is making the software that allows you to put images from a drone or a cell phone or a you know, a GoPro into it and then get these maps and models out of it. So you absolutely own your data the whole way through. The only thing is, even if you pay, we have desktop and then we also have cloud. So if you paid for the cloud, which means the process on the, on the internet, right. Then you just make sure you download it after. So it goes to your own computer. So if you lose okay. your license or something, then you still have everything. I think that's really important. Yes. Thank you. Looks like Probin has a question as well about the digital twin creation. I don't know if you want me to read it to you or it's just right there in our chat. But he was asking about the twin creation indoors. No GPS. Right I don't there. have the chat. Where's the chat? Uh, along the bottom. You should be able to pop open the chat. Um, and he was wondering if your application support other types of data input to be overlaid on an ortho, such as multi-hyper spectral imaging. LIDAR. So ours does not. That's a great question. So PIX4D really focuses on the production of the data, which mean that we take the images, we turn them into 3D models and maps, and then you can export everything from PIX4D and put that into GIS, so into ArcGIS or QGIS and layer everything in there to do your research. So we make the data, then you put it into GIS or CAD and do the analysis in the other software. Okay, and the first question was uh, about the indoor. So I'm assuming that with photogrammetry only, you don't need GPS to be able to build the, uh, the data you were showing, okay. So if anybody has an iPad Pro or a newer iPhone, like an iPhone 8 and above, we just came up with a free application for your iPhone or your iPad called Pix40 Catch. Like you're catching imagers. I think maybe it also is related to Pokemon Go where you catch things, but I shouldn't, they may get mad at me if I say that. I just did it. Uh, so then you get the Pix40 Catch app and basically you just hold your iPad up and you walk around and it'll take a ton of photos and then it'll apply the geotags and apply the information to it. Um, and then you can upload that to Pix40 Mapper to process it. You can, it, that's a very easy way to make indoor 3D models uh, with the iPad instead of having to use the drone, uh, which is possible today. Wow, that's fantastic. So, all right, does anybody else have any quick questions? We are kind of running out of time, but we might have time for one more quick question. If not, I did put his information into our chat. So if you want to save the chat, you want to save the information, three dots down in the lower right-hand corner and you save chat. That way you'll have all the information there for you. I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, good morning. 
so if you're a new if you're new getting into the drone industry you just got your say phantom 4 v2 and you just got your part 107 and you're interested in 3d modeling where should somebody that's just getting involved in drones because we're at that level with people where should they start with pix 4d the first thing that i would do is determine whether you're willing to spend 150 dollars or not if you're willing to spend 150 dollars we produced a 12 hour self paced course, which is like on your own time on your own computer. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, mm -hmm. because with COVID, we can't do in person training. Right. Anymore. Cool. Now, this is a new science, right? People have to learn right. to use it. So, the first thing you do is you Google getting started with Fix 40. Okay. You don't spend any money at all. We have 700 articles for free, we have 40 YouTube videos for free. And you can email me, unga.sing at pix40.com. And then I will just send you an email with all the fast links. So you don't even have to search for the links. You just click one, two, three, four, and it'll open up the links for you. And I'll curate that. The best, well, that's the second best way. The best way is to email and get, ask for a quote for a 12 hour self-paced course. And it's 12 hours. You do it on your own time. You do it at home. Um, and it will teach you everything from start to finish. And that's taught by one of our instructors, Justine, um, who we put her in a film studio. And we made her film the whole course that she would teach two days in person, except online recorded and then structured it nicely. Um, so that's definitely the best way to move forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Hang it. I have a quick question. If you have a second, did you yeah. have any uh, updates as far as thermal mapping? Is there any particular software that we could use to have uh, a thermal mesh or possibly a map with radiometric data? So, this is a great question and it's a bit of a loaded question. So thermal mapping, I definitely am very interested in thermal mapping. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite subject areas. So right now, because Pix40 tries to come from the very scientific, you know, high level approach, we want our data to be really accurate and thermal mapping, the technology behind creating thermal mapping is not there yet but we're doing R and D internally. You can absolutely make a thermal map today in Pix4D Mapper. Actually, if you just Google mapping in thermal Pix4D, it'll come up with our question and answer page for thermal mapping. Um, and it's, uh, it, it has all these really good research. I did a webinar with FLIR a year and a half ago, specific to thermal mapping, teaching people how to do that. And so, yes, you can absolutely do it. Right now, the best ways to do thermal mapping are gonna be for inspecting roofs inspecting pavement, uh, water ingress on commercial roofs. Those are really where thermal mapping is very, very powerful. Fast thermal mapping doesn't exist, it's fake. So we don't wanna make fake algorithms. So we don't, we haven't produced that yet. There's still a lot, a lot of R&D that goes into place. The biggest thing is if you make a thermal map at Pix40 Mapper, the temperature values are not gonna be correct. You have to keep that in mind. You can never take a thermal map with and have it have accurate uh, temperature values. It doesn't exist yet today. What you do do is you see what's colder and what's hotter. And that's important because usually if there's a temperature difference, there's something wrong with it. And so then you can figure out the exact area of the roof that needs to be re replaced and exactly where the problem exists. So thermal maps today are absolutely possible in Pix40 Mapper. And that's one of the only softwares on the market that can do it, but the temperature values will not be correct. They are only for finding out exactly where the problem is and how big the problem is. Great information. So much good information today. Mm -hmm. We cannot thank you enough. It was fantastic. And uh, the whole bunch of thank yous coming in through our chat. Again, if you wanted to get his information, I put it in the chat for you. And thank you so, so much. I know people are going to be reaching out to you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an email. I'm, um, you know, I'm a millennial, so I'm, I'm really good at chatting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. And thanks for the great questions. And we will see you next week. All right. Bye. Nice see you, everybody. Thank you, Rosie. Bye. Bye, Kim. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, mm -hmm. Pix4D. See you, Jim. See you on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Stay safe.